Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, February 24th, 5.28 a.m. Central Time this morning. Matt Bennett, Brian Split. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. How are you, bud? Good. It's early. Thank you for joining me. Um, hey, guys, the corn market collapsed yesterday. Why did that happen? Uh, go ahead, Matt. I got a couple <laughs> of thoughts. Oh, good Lord. I think uh, for, for one thing, I think you, you look at this market and you just uh, you got to feed it something. Uh, you sideways forever you know you come in here to the outlook forum numbers and you know i think people were expecting well maybe we'll get a big number or whatnot in my opinion it's just kind of one of these things that at some point you shift the mentality just a little bit and you say you know what uh, we're going to start plugging numbers in and, and i gotta think that 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 was going to happen inevitably why it happened yesterday to be honest i don't have any really good reason otherwise but i do think you're going to have to shift mentality from an old crop situation to a new one and a new one just does not look near as good especially with a little bit of demand destruction over the last several months yeah and you know joe uh we do the technical videos quite a bit and I, my brain likes to simplify things into what the chart uh suggests and so we looked at that and had that uh, ascending triangle pattern on corn uh much like the pattern that uh, we had back from september into november uh, eventually making highs during the month of October. And the, the, the structure of the market just looked eerily similar. And uh, we took out that uptrend from the ascending triangle and, and saw that first down day uh, yesterday. Um, so to me, it looks like we're projected to go back and retest the December lows on the May contract. And the measurement would be actually right back down to that 636 and three quarter level for May. Let's go back to the Ag Outlook form numbers for a second. So here's how USDA, this is, guys, this is the 23-24 balance sheet that USDA has some initial projections for. Um, they're not really based on anything. They're educated guesses. I actually kind of, I don't mind their acreage numbers. They've got 91 for corn and 87 and a half for beans. Like, I don't, I don't disagree with that necessarily. Um, the yield that USDA is starting with, and this is just a projection of what could happen under ideal circumstances, 181 and a half, I guess, is their trend yield. But this is the scary part I think that a lot of people saw is that they're looking at this 1.9 billion bushel carry out, which pushes your stocks to use ratio up to 13%. That's a bearish situation. But gosh, I mean, you need so much to go right for, for that to happen. I mean, to get all those acres planted, that's possible but to to attain that yield in particular i think a lot of people believe that's a tall task you know i guess in my opinion whenever you look at for instance the weather situation you know uh talking to a couple of the guys that we've talked to it seems to me that we've got a little better chance for a trend line yield this year than what we've had uh, the last three years for instance you've had uh, obviously la nina rearing its head it sure looks like we're switching out of that uh, but I agree with you. If you're going to plant 91 million acres, obviously that's more acres than last year. You know, anytime you get above 90, uh, obviously your average acre is probably not, um, you know, as ideal. But at the same time, I do think genetics are capable. In fact, Joe, I would I'd have to argue that I think a 180, 185 type yield is possible, if not likely, in the 185, next year or two. You're going to scare people, Matt. I, I do think that it's possible, if not likely. And the reason I say that is, you know, whenever I go out and talk to folks, you know, people will just say they're planting better genetics than what they ever thought they'd see. I mean, yes, Joe, it's no secret here in Illinois, we had a heck of a crop this year. Uh, we saw yields on the yield monitor that I never dreamed I'd see, quite frankly. And I think if Mother Nature, Nature cooperates, uh, if a state like Illinois can go 214 with not everyone having a great year, I still think that you can see a U.S. Uh, yield easily over 180. So the the Ag Outlook numbers were, if if you want to consider them to be real, by any stretch of the imagination, they were bearish. I just don't know that they're real. But at the same time, I mean, you've got a trade that's like just thirsty for numbers. I mean, there's there's been so little data out there and such a little movement in the market. Maybe this is uh, what it took to to move the thing was some fresh news from USDA, albeit just educated guesses. One thing that caught my eye um, in their soybean balance sheet, I think USDA was projecting that uh, domestic crush is only going to increase by like three and a half percent next year, uh, despite the fact that we've got all these new crush plants going up. Um, I feel like that could be a little bit low and USDA has not really acknowledged to any significant degree that we've got this crush expansion. Do you guys have any thoughts on the demand side of any of the balance sheets? I mean, they're all just guesses. You're talking about a marketing year that doesn't begin until September 1st for row crops, you know? Yeah, you're going to continue to see that uh, balance between um, fighting for export uh, versus crush. 
Uh, we know that crush capacity is going to be increasing over the next several years. Um, and I think the USDA has taken a, a cautious approach to uh, uh, realizing that potential increase on the balance sheet. Um, you know, maybe they should be taking that same cautious approach to these yield estimates uh, since we really only raised, uh, you know, what, 177 bushel per acre uh, corn crop as far as our, our max yield so far. Uh, but again, these are our trend line yields. And with the uh, with the demand, um, you know, crush is going to be a big component of this moving forward as we see the renewable diesel initiatives uh, really get going here in the next couple of years. The one thing that you mentioned, Brian, was this corn chart, which uh, after yesterday does not look so good. My chart's probably fairly similar to yours. Uh, we had like a couple different short term support areas that were busted yesterday. You got through this first one here. Um, I would imagine that that probably helped to accelerate some selling interest, right? Correct. Uh, so if you look at that flat top uh, and you've got 686 denoted above there, uh, that flat top with with the uh, the uptrending market, uh, whether it's kind of the short term trend from the January lows, so the, the lows for the year uh, or the uh, the uptrend back from from fall. Uh, these are, are your ascending triangles. So you've got the flat base above the market and then the short term uptrends. And so taking out those uptrends is what uh, can, uh, constitutes the breakout to the downside. Um, so I have it where it measures right back down to that 636 and three quarter low. Yeah. Um, but uh, to me, it looks a lot like that high that we made again back in fall where you've got more or less a flat base. Uh, you've got that one little peak that sticks out in fall, but it's the same structure. You have kind of that short term uptrend. And then once you go uh, through that uptrend line back in fall, we saw that first leg lower. We consolidated a little bit and then another leg down. And I think you're going to see this thing kind of do the same thing after uh, after it's structured the same way. I could look at this two different ways. I could say, you know, oh crap, we just took out these two trend lines. And the other way I could look at it is, you know what, we're halfway, we're, we're right smack dab in the middle of this range from this December low to this recent high. And maybe it's just, maybe short term, it's like, okay, not as good looking, but it, you could still argue that this is sideways, I guess. Uh, Matt, another thing I wanted to mention was farmer selling potentially. So if you've got a March basis contract, uh, they forced you to either price it or roll it here. Uh, Monday would be like last day for any of that, but a lot of that occurred this week. Do you think that's an issue uh, in regard to the corn market? I think so. I mean, in all honesty, you know what most folks are going to do if they've held on to it at this point. Uh, I do think the farmer's flush with cash, and I, I certainly uh, uh, would like to think that they'd look at it a little differently, and I'll say why in a minute, but I do think that a lot of folks rolled, and so you know, a little bit of pressure on front month. But mm -hmm. I think one thing that we've got to remember, Joe, as producers, is that uh, new operating notes are going to be starting up here before too awful long. And the cost of ownership, you know, we've done some work on that. Actually, one of the guys with JSA did cost of ownership for corn and soybeans right now is going to be the highest we've seen in in many, many years. And so uh, with that being the case, I think we need to pay close attention to, you know, what are our expectations for kind of roll if we're going to go ahead and hold on? We've got to understand that it costs quite a bit more. I mean, soybeans right now is over 10 cents a bushel per month. Uh, you know, and so obviously with corn, it's going to be maybe around a third of that. But regardless, it's going to be extremely expensive. Yeah, that's an issue that uh, we haven't had to deal with in, what, 15 years? I mean, higher interest rates. I've done some stuff, some extensive stuff um, in my uh, premium content with both you guys and with uh, Chris Barron about um, cost, what we call cost of storage. I mean, if you've got grain stored on the farm, if it's if it's tied to an operating note, I mean, you're paying to store your own grain essentially because the interest is so high it's just that used to be normal but i mean we haven't had to deal with it for 15 years there's a lot of a lot of younger guys and maybe even not so younger guys who've never had to deal with this um interest rate thing absolutely yeah, and, and i think i think one just one sorry brian um uh, i think you got to remember as a producer if your new operating notes coming in do the math. You've got to understand how this works because obviously uh, a lot of folks were flush with cash, but at the same time, if you've got a couple hundred thousand bushels of corn in the bin and then you're sitting here paying seven, eight percent, maybe yeah. nine on an operating yeah. note, uh, pay close attention there. And, and there's still ways to own the bushels without physically owning them. Um, when you think about the interest on the nominal value of 650 or $7 cash corn uh, versus just 
paying the interest on the margin uh, on a futures contract or paying the interest on uh, the value of a call maybe that takes you out to June. Uh, there's a really big difference there. So uh, if, if there's still the desire to maintain ownership of the bushels, there's a lot cheaper ways to do it than continuing to sit and own the physical in your bin. I would agree with that, especially given that I don't know what option volatility did yesterday, but generally speaking, uh, options have been fairly affordable on a relative basis. Uh, let's skip to Argentina. So these crop estimates continue to be cut. The uh, grain exchange there, they've got the soybean crop now at 33 and a half down sharply from I think they were 38 previously. Uh, USDA is still at 41. The whisper numbers that I've heard are like 30 or below which would mark a decline of what, like 35% from what we thought it might be preseason. That's a cut of like, I mean, you're talking six or 700 million bushels less than what we thought it might be back in September, October. I mean, this is a big reason why the bean market continues to act a little bit better than say the corn market or the wheat market, relatively speaking. Jimmy, yesterday was actually pretty impressive whenever you look yeah. at it. I mean, uh, you, you see corn down 13, 14, 15 cents at one time and beans down six or seven. That's not common. And so I agree with you. Whenever you look at these uh, estimates out of South America, I mean, nine times out of 10, it seems like it's kind of a race to the bottom, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, there are some unknowns here. There's no doubt that uh, they had some extreme weather. And with that being the case, I think it's going to give you kind of an underpinning, make it very interesting as you move closer to spring time frame, because obviously it's going to spill over into your, uh, you know, your fall contracts. And uh, beans have done quite a bit of work here lately. I know we've talked about this a little, Joe, but uh, I do think cheaper fertilizer prices are going to factor into the mix, but it makes it a little bit uh, of a complex situation whenever you look at what the acreage mix might look like, especially on some of these swing acres. It's an old story. I mean, it's not an old story. It's it's kind of a fluid story, but like the fact that the Argentina crop is going to be light is not anything new. We're just kind of trying to get down into the nitty gritty here in terms of uh, details. Uh, ethanol production was up a little bit last week. This is not a bad number at all. 1.029. Um, up fractionally versus the same week last year. Uh, the one problem with ethanol, if there is one, production's been all right. It's probably not quite where it needs to be. But ethanol stocks are record high seasonally. They're now above last year's seasonal levels, at least. Um, do you see any problems with the high ethanol stocks potentially moving forward? I think the ethanol stocks are, are going to be an issue, um, and that's been an issue over the last couple of months as we go back into December, I think, is when the stocks issue really started to become a, a, a play here. And, and I think when you look at some of the energy charts, um, you look at uh, crude oil, for example, and, and it looks like we're making a, a head and shoulder pattern there um, that would measure into the low 60s, around 62, 63. And if that's something that comes to fruition, um, that I don't think speaks very positively to uh, to uh, the ethanol usage here moving forward. So I think that would be a concern. I know that some people look at the if you look at those grain crush reports, like we are not where we need to be in terms of uh, corn demand via ethanol. Like I think USDA is projecting we're going to be off one one and a half percent or something from last year, but the numbers would indicate that we could be off three percent, four percent, which doesn't sound like a lot. But I mean, you're talking hundreds of millions of bushels, if that's the case. So the ethanol thing, it, it needs to it needs to stay good. We've been better here the last few weeks. It needs to stay good. The problem, I, I think, uh, of course, is going to be your margins. I mean, you know, you you get into the Western Corn Belt and some of these places, uh, you know, of course, you're going to slow down a little bit because yeah, it costs you so much to get the corn to you. So mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt that, in my opinion, you're going to have to make a further uh uh, revision downward and that, i think uh, again that's something people need to pay attention to because uh, it could it only has a problem uh, for your this year's balance sheet yeah it's tight uh, but you start uh, trimming that demand away and you don't just get it to come directly back into the equation uh, you're going to have to do something which typically means price going lower uh, to get uh, demand uh, spurred yeah uh, Vilsack still pushing Mexico on this GMO corn deal. My understanding of the situation is that given that decree that Mexico uh, put out last week, they're, they're going to allow for the import of uh, GMO corn for animal feed for industrial use. But Vilsack is sticking to his guns here. And he said he's not happy even about the, the potential ban, uh, ban on glyphosate and also um, what would be like GMO white corn, I guess. So they may actually take some formal action under the USMCA here if this issue is not resolved. So Mexico is one of our biggest and most reliable corn importers. Um, do you see this as an issue? Is, is Mexico just seeking some leverage in, in regard to something else? 
That's yeah. my opinion. I think it's got to do with other things, uh, auto parts, uh, just leverage for other trade negotiation discussions. Um, but uh, knowing that they are uh, one of our largest uh, buyers of corn, uh, that's quite a bit of leverage. Yeah. Yeah. And I think whenever you're talking uh, the, the amount of cattle they, they feed, you're not going to be able to source, uh, in my opinion, considering we've got rail built specifically just to go to Mexico and it's the cheapest place that they're going to be able to get corn nine times out of 10, even with currency issues. I've got to think that it would just completely cripple their cattle industry if they're going to go totally away from GM, GMO corn. So I don't know, in my opinion, I think a lot of it's uh, rhetoric and a lot of it's trade talk. Yeah, I think for 98% of you guys watching, if you just are growing yellow number two, you're fine. If you're a white GMO corn grower, you may have some issues here, but I'm hoping that uh, Vilsack gets this thing worked out. There's some provisions under this USMCA that that uh, Mexico may be breaking, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Brazil's got some planting issues. Ag Rural says that more than half of the crops in Paraná and Mato Grosso do Sul will be planted outside of the ideal planting window. Uh, they said this, the second and third biggest producing states will plant more than 50% of the second corn crop after the ideal window. Uh, so they've had all sorts of rain there recently. And I've got the forecast on my screen here. They've got more rain coming for these uh, big second corn areas. Do you guys think these planting delays mean anything? I know all the estimates are still indicative of a record crop, certainly. I think they do. I mean, the thing is, is that whenever you get, you you push back already, whenever you, whenever you plant this crop at an ideal time, anytime you get past pollination the dry season starts in you know and so uh, you you push past uh, optimal uh, i guess planting window and all of a sudden you're in a situation that um, you, you know you could see a big cut uh, there's no doubt that in the past the historical evidence is that uh, a safrania crop that's planted late is going to suffer at least to some degree so uh, you know you look at corn uh, stock uh, production uh, worldwide it's already down 65 million tons. I mean, it's kind of a big deal. We all also know that demand's been down somewhat, but if you start really cutting into the safrina crop, it's going to be for this corn market that it, it probably is going to be looking for here pretty soon. The one thing that they mentioned was that late planting raises your potential for frost risk uh, later in the year. And that seems to be their big issue right now. But I mean, late planting is not ideal when it comes to uh, yield potential, but this forecast doesn't look too good. I mean, uh, it's it, they've been wet, which is overall, I mean, overall a positive, but can be a double edged sword this time of year, I guess. Uh, China has unveiled a 12 point blueprint for bringing peace uh, to Ukraine. This was very quickly dismissed by the U.S. Uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said this. This war could end tomorrow if Russia stopped attacking Ukraine and withdrew its forces. So I don't think I'm not going to read through the 12 points, um, but China is is this just posturing here? Is that all this is? That's, That's what it looks like. Yeah, uh, the war would end uh, if everybody just all went home. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Um, but uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, I don't know what the exact 12 uh, points are, what the details are. Uh, but um, I read through them and I didn't think they were worth mentioning. Put it that way. Yeah. And you know what? Um, they've got their own things going on. I think the world's kind of trying to figure out what China's going to do with Taiwan. And maybe this is a little bit of deflection here as they've got their own uh, things that they're about to kick off. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, we've got export sales this morning. Corn sales expected 501.3 soybeans, 300 to 850 wheat, 150 to 500. Uh, cattle market was up yesterday. Uh, still looks pretty good to me, Matt. Oh, absolutely. You know, this BSE deal out of Brazil. I mean, I saw a couple of headlines later on that uh, there's still a couple of folks that are talking that they'll be able to still export beef out of Brazil. But at the same time, it's just a little more fuel to a fire that's already burning kind of hot. And then, of course, Joe, uh, you, you're healing up pastures in the Western Corn Belt. And some of these forecasts are that you're going to continue to heal up pastures. And I think you and I have already talked about this, but you start retaining heifers in the West and, and, and you're looking at an extremely dynamic uh, fat cattle market moving forward. I'd say into the later part of this year, uh, first quarter of, uh, of 24. But I mean, this this is a pretty bullish situation. Chart looks good. Fundamentals appear to be good. Cash market strong. Uh, speaking of markets that are not strong, stock markets down this morning. Uh, Brian, what's your S&P 500 chart look like? Uh, S&P 500 chart took out some support here. It's trying to hold um, after after doing that, but uh, it looks to me like we've got some additional downside. And I wouldn't be surprised to see if uh, things accelerate a little bit as we get towards the uh, the back end of the quarter here, the first quarter of the year. 
there's been a change of attitudes or sentiment when it comes to the Fed. Like people are thinking higher rates for longer now, whereas maybe three or four weeks ago, that was not so much the case. Uh, crude oil is attempting a modest recovery this morning, up 27 cents at uh, 75.66 in the April WTI. Hey, guys, thank you for joining me early this morning. Uh, have a great weekend. All right. Same to you, bud. I catch you. Catch you next week.